so I invite everyone uh, to listen to Professor Najib George Awad and his lecture on Islam and uh, versus Europe, Islam in Europe and European Islam on tracing relationship with models in today's scholarship. Uh, Najib Awad is an interesting scholar. He is born in Syria uh, with the full experience of what it means to live in the Middle East. He is Christian, but he is ethnic from Syriac Aramaic roots, which is, you know, the mixture of various parts that is present in him personally. He, uh, he is strongly attached to the question of the future of the Middle East, the future of democracy in the Middle East, the future of the churches in the Middle East, and the future of humanity in the Middle East. And strongly believes and argues for it in his publications that religions can play a positive role in the development of democracy, peace, and uh, intellectual exchange in the Middle East as of today. But he's also personally uh, involved in constructing a, a kind of theological pedagogy for his age of launching dialogue, and that's connected with this practical sense of his field, uh, how to make a theology uh, visibly present in building a constructive society built on communication and mutual responsibility. So the interrelationship between the intellectual, the cultural, and the religious context they belong to is very much at the heart of Professor Najib George Awad's scholarship, uh, teaching, and also uh, as a politician, or I would add, as a church politician. So by these small words, I invite you, Professor Awad, to uh, start your lecture. And you're heartily welcome, not physically in a three dimension, but in two dimensional, uh, in the two dimensional reality, you are present here in Sweden today even though it's in the morning in the States. <laughs> um, the, the, not the, I would say the floor is yours, but I say the screen is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Elm. Thank you very much for this very generous and kind introduction. I appreciate everything you said about me. Um, and I'm really glad to have the chance you avail to me to communicate with esteemed um, scholars, audience uh, from Sweden or in Sweden. And um, uh, you, um, Professor Helm was absolutely right in saying that I am deeply interested in um, Eastern Christianity and interreligious life in the Middle East from all these perspectives. But as also a scholar who lives in the West and works in the West, I'm also interested in um, um, studying the religious activities, Christian and Muslim alike, in the Western world. And um, this is why uh, what I'm gonna share with you today is not really related directly to the Middle East. It will touch upon that, but it's uh, more about um, how scholarly I read the scene in academia about uh, how um, the uh, um, scholars uh, study the Islam in light of the relation to Europe or the West in general. So today I'm gonna allow myself as Middle Easterner to travel with you to your own context, sort of the broader context of uh, uh, Europe, uh, which is very versatile and also the West in general and how Islam is approached by scholars. Um, Throughout the fifth, past 15 years, I had the chance to write about Islam in relation to the Western context in general within the framework of various subjects and study cases. The scholarly research I conducted during the past years invited me to realize that there are various approaches to the interaction between Islam and the European or Western world. My scholarly journey on this trajectory drives me to relate that there are three mainline approaches in the academic scholarship to the connection between Islam and Europe. Uh, 
Um, in this lecture, I'm going to suggest that these three mainline questions like trends of hermeneutic are ones that either approach the relation in form of Islam and or versus Europe, or in form of Islam in Europe, or finally in terms of Islamic Europe or European Islam. In the ensuing sections, I shall unravel the notional, relational, hermeneutical, and analytical connotations and implications of each one of the three equations before I finally conclude with few critical and assessing points and then open the floor for your inquiries and comments. So let me start. The first equation is Islam and Europe. This approach is scholarly the oldest intellectual hermeneutic model one can find in Western scholarship on Islam. It goes back to the European late Middle Ages and Renaissance periods. It images the relation with Islam to be a relation of tension, alterity, and contrariety, and even antagonism. This trend of thought images Europe from a Christendom perspective and deems Islam the totally other adversarial religion over against Christianity and its world, which is totally identified with the Latin Roman world that became Europe later on. We have here an approach to Islam and to Europe alike that is essentialized and ideological in nature. Islam and Europe becomes Islam versus the Christian Europe. The tension between these two sides is expressive of a clash of civilization state of relationality. In relation to the Christian Europe versus Islam equation, Western Orientalism and the Orientalist scholarship of the 19th and 20th centuries played a major role in creating and proliferating this cognitive and essentialized reading of Islam versus Europe discourse. In the classical Western and European Orientalist approaches to Islam as a historical and religious phenomenon alike, there was a predominant tendency to always approach Islam as a counterparting, adversarial, contrasting religious entity standing in parallel, not in correlation, with the Christian Jewish history and heritage, whether in the Western European world or the Eastern Arab world. The majority of the classical Orientalist scholars who studied the history of Islam and of the non-Muslim Christian and Jewish communities in relation to Islam tended to focus on the apologetic, polemic, and totally defensive nature of the relation between Islam and these other realities. These Christians and Jews were often studied as primarily obsessed with survival, identity reservation, and legacy protection over against or in sharp dividing parallel parallelism with Islam. What we have here is a reading of Islam in adversarial relation with the non-Muslim world, whether in the East or the West, that emphatically approach such a relation from a clash of religions perspective. In this reading, the Muslim's relation to whoever is not Muslim inside the, the Arab Muslim world or to whoever is not Muslim in the Western European world as well, as well represent religious opposition between two groups who happen to exist on the same planet in this universe yet they decided to exist as if they are two separate islands in an ocean. It is known that this Orientalist hermeneutic framework was questioned and deconstructed in Western primarily American scholarship around the last three decades of the 20th century. We all know Edward, Edward Said's criticism in his classical monograph Orientalism and his presentation of the Orientalist scholars stances on Islam in the Middle East. Scholars interested in the post-colonialist area of study are also familiar with Talal Assad's anthropologization of Said's anti-Orientalism hypothesis and radically revolutionizing it throughout the past decades in various monographs or editorials of his, like Anthropology and the Colonial Encounter in 1973, Genealogies of Religion, Discipline and Reasons of Power in Christianity and Islam in 1993, or even his latest monographs during the past 10 years, like Formations of the Secular Christianity, Islam and Modernity in 2003, and Secular Translations, National State, Modern Self and Calculative Reason in 2018. 
There's no time or space here to elaborate further on or in depth on this anti-Orientalism genre of public intellectual discoursing. Suffice it to bring to your attention that this voice against a well, a West Europe and or versus Islam, which Saeed, Assad and other scholars raised, reached at full strength the shores of the Arab Muslim intellectual context in the Middle East and Northern Africa. There, scholars embraced the Saidian, Assadian pejorative criticism of the West European stance on Islam, and they considered it quite supportive and affirmative of a worldview, which dug its roots deep in the soil of the Arab Muslim imagination about the Western European feelings toward Islam throughout history. The West Europe and or versus Islam equation was thus adopted fully and the anti-Orientalism attack was mimicked unreservedly. The Arab Muslim intellectuals manifested this trend by means of two stances. The first stance. Some Arab Muslim authors reach, reacted by saying that the West and Europe are not the enemy of the Arab Muslim world. The real enemy for them is Orientalism as such. Thus, they focused on withstanding Orientalism per se, instead of spending time developing a political intellectual front to antagonize the Western world or the European neighbors on the Northern and Western shores of the Mediterranean Sea. What these Arab Muslim scholars did is developing a counter intellectual discourse to dismantle Orientalism intellectually and cognitively. This counter discourse was called Occidentalism, al-Istighrab in Arabic. The first Arab Muslim author who inaugurated the launching of the, Orient of the Occidentalist discourse against Orientalism was the Syrian philosopher Sadiq Jalal al-Azm, who published in 1981 his book, Al-Istishraq wal istishraq Ma'kusan, Orientalism and Orientalism Reversed. Al-Azm's call for developing an Occidentalist voice to withstand Orientalism was welcomed by the Egyptian philosopher Hassan Hanafi, who in 1991 echoed the very same call in a book titled Muqaddima fi Ilm al-Istighrab, an introduction to the science of Occidentalism. Very recently, the writings of the Palestinian-Canadian professor of Columbia University in New York, Wael Hallaq, and their highly offensive and pejorative voice against Orientalism and colonialism seems to be feeding well the prolongation of the above mentioned Occidentalist approach. The second stance. The second stance one can find among the Arab Muslim thinkers about the West Europe and or versus Islam approach is one which travels beyond the mere intellectual boundaries of counterparting inimical scholarship toward expressing high suspicion and even tension toward the West and Europe as such. This approach reads the West and Europe as ontologically the world of Greek, Christian, Jewish civilization that has been always Islam's primary foe throughout history. They call for withstanding this enmity by all means possible and for using philosophy and cultural traditions of Islam as instrument in a life or death battle against the ultimate enemy of it. There are two of these of the most prominent voices on this in the Arab Muslim world I can bring to your attention today. The first is the Moroccan Taha Abdul Rahman who calls in his writing for developing a Muslim Arab resisting philosophy against the Greek Jewish Christian colonial attempts of the West, especially Europe. The second voice is the late Egyptian scholar, Muhammad Amara, who not only calls for a resisting philosophy, but also for a jihadi intellectual philosophy against the West in protection of Islam. I cannot proceed longer about this first trend because I need to take you to the other two ones I promised to speak about in my paper. What I can say here is that this West slash Europe and slash versus Islam approach drives both sides, the Westerners in their relatedness to Islam and the Muslims in their relatedness to the West 
to essentialize and otherize each other in such a perception of alterity that lies in total contrariety and conflictual competition. Let me move now to the second model one can find in academics, uh, academic work on Islam and Europe which I call here Islam in Europe. If the previous model is to be described as essentialized and ideological, this model of relationality can fairly be deemed existential and psychological in nature. It is an expression of an approach to Islam that views it as a from within threat, from within threat to Europe and the West. This is the model of relationality, which is usually applied to European and Western stance on emigrated and migrated Islam, impersonated in those millions of emigrants and migrants from the Muslim world who ended up residing and living inside the European and Western countries. Islam in Europe hermeneutic trend tends now to treat the Muslims as foreign communities that are not a threat out there, they are rather a challenge right here inside the European societies and side by side with these societies, local and indigenous, historically non-Muslim groups and social segments. In Islam in Europe equation, the European Zitzimleben in its cultural, political, religious and civilizational variations approach Islam either from the perspective of the Muslim immigrants and residents integration or disintegration into the hosting society, or these Muslims are labeled for good with the insignia of foreigners and strangers, and they are psychologically apprehended, suspiciously treated and feared from. The first stance can be described as existential islamo otherizing while the second stance can be called psychological Islamophobia. And let me share a few ideas about each one of these two stances. The first stance. Last January, I published a chapter in an anthology on the otherizing strategy that is practiced by both the hosting European societies and the emigrating or refugeeing newcomers who now reside in the continent. The very same otherizing strategy which some European communities followed toward the refugees who flooded into Europe during summer 2015 has been similarly exerted on the Muslim refugees who emigrated to European countries since the beginning of the past century. Muslim residents and citizens in this version of Islam in Europe equation are systematically otherized and looked at as this other who will never one day be like me or as I am. The otherizing of Islam in Europe, which I talk about here, is an action, is a behavioral strategy, is a defining and categorizing process. It is that intellectual and cognitive process of self-defining by categorizing the other in such a manner that not only emphasizes who I am, but it also presumes premeditatedly that the other cannot, let alone is not allowed sometimes to be the same as I am. The other is not entitled to be looked at and appreciated as one who stands with me on the same level of existence, nature, value, and rights. On the political and societal levels, otherizing seems to have not found its exit out of the um, European imagination. One can still detect a constructed image of the Muslim immigrants that treat them as, a, as people with fixed identities and characteristics, thus defining what is Muslim exclusively in terms of its otherness and viewing the Muslim as above all the other. So this is the first stance. The second stance, if the first variation on Islam in Europe manifest itself in existential Islamo-otherizing tendency. The second variation images itself in psychological Islamophobia. The phobia tendency treats Islam as a source of threat 
as a dangerous terrorizing evil, which attempts at securing its own existence, not just in contrast with the European contexts, but rather as these contexts replacement and alternative. In 2013, I touched upon the challenge of Islamophobia in the European context in an essay that was published in the Muslim World Journal. Islamophobia manifests itself in the European context and declares its frank presence every now and then when European citizens clash with Muslim communities and reflect unfriendly attitude toward them, while the Muslims in return cry out against the Western public and use the public square to force the government to foster more tolerance and application of Muslim belief. The past two decades, especially after September 11, availed to Muslims a prevailing foothold on the stage of European public squares and media, as they angrily, even violently sometimes, expressed that things like writing literature against the Prophet, mocking Muhammad in comic caricatures, making movies that polemically expose Islam's values and principles, or disallowing the wearing of niqab in public places, these are just examples, are unforgivable and intolerable offenses against Islam itself. In response to these confrontational incidents, which Muslims perpetrated, considerable numbers of Europeans do sometimes also express their phobia toward the Islamic presence in Europe, implicitly or explicitly yelling in the Muslims' faces, we are not content with your integration into society. We are afraid of your religious motives and values. There is no doubt that the Islam in Europe reading of the relation between Islam and the Western European contexts expresses a serious situation the European societies find themselves drowned in. There's no way and no need, I believe, to conceal the fact that rather than merely dealing with individual, certain official civil or religious institutions or governmental cabinet, we have a mass of public and common citizens expressing their psychological unease toward a religious other, as well as their serious fear that there would not be one day a reconciliation between this other's religiosity with the conventional secular values of European societies. The attention to Islamophobia during the past years is rapidly intensifying instead of washing away. It became one of the primary phenomena for the probing and analyzing sake of which huge budgets were devoted and new academic positions were established in the non Muslim world. It is my belief that the second relational model one finds in the academic and public approaches to the connection between Islam and Europe, which I call here Islam in Europe, expresses this Islamophobia tendency more predominantly than expressing the otherizing tendency, which I spoke about above. I personally believe nevertheless, and that's now my personal conviction, and as I argued actually in my mentioned essay of 2013, that what the Muslims need to understand is that what we witness in the Western and European context might not essentially be a fear from Islam in specific or exclusively. It is my conviction that what we witness sociologically and culturally in the European context might actually be better diagnosed as religiophobia, fear from the return of religiosity and its influential role back into the European contemporary public squares. It is a phobia toward all religiosities, even the ones that are considered historically and civilizationally definitive of the European imagination. It is thus a phobia toward the resurgence of Christianity and Islam or any other religiosity that dreams of making the religious imagination dominant and prevailing over other imaginations in the substantially pluralist and secular societies of the European context. Let me move now to the third model I'm proposing in my paper. Muslim Europe 
or European Islam. The third relational model is a recent trend of reasoning comparing to the other above mentioned two models. It is predominantly sociological, anthropological, and contextual in perspectives. It does not focus on Islam as such. It rather follows Max Weber's and Emil Durkheim's understanding of the phenomenon called religion as first and foremost, the individual and the collective manifestations, the individual and the collective manifestations of the religious people. In this sense, the focus of this model is not on Islam, but on the Muslims. And when Islam is being probed, it is realized as primarily, if not exclusively, these Muslims, and not as a religious dogma or discourse. Islam in this model is reduced into a Weltanschauung or into mere kultur. In this hermeneutic trend of European Islam, the Muslims are no more seen as merely human beings existing in Europe, but rather as human beings who are of Europe, who belongs fully to the European Zitzim label. They are Europeans in identity and perception and nothing else. They are European Islamic models of human beingness, not Arab or African or Asian ones. European countries today contain among their inhabitants fourth, fifth, or even sixth generations of Muslim youth who were born on the lands of the old continent and who knew no living place, home of origin, or uprise, up raising contexts other than the European life contexts wherein they were born, they grew up, and they root all their life's experiences and awarenesses in. These Muslims are Europeans and Westerners and nothing else because they do not belong to anything else and their self-awareness is not shaped by or generated from any other human webs of meaning. In 2016, I published an essay in Arabic titled Politics and Islamophobia in Al Jadid Arab Intellectual Journal that is published in London, UK. In this essay, I talked about the above mentioned European Islam. I argued that it is scientifically implausible to speak about Islam, Christianity, Judaism, etc., etc., as if they are fixed, static, and absolute, objective, and objectifiable entities. In reality, there are Islams. Christianities, Judaisms that are as numerous and diverse as the Muslims and the Christians and Jews and others who represent these religiosities in their existence and self-perception. On the basis of this, I invited for speaking of Western Islam, European Islam, American Islam, Swedish Islam, German Islam, French Islam, as much as we speak about Arabic Islam, Asian Islam, or African Islam. What I am talking about here is not just the existence of a number of holders of European citizenships who follow Islam as a religion. What I talk about here is an Islamic self-perception and worldview, Weltanschauung, that originated, grew, and evolved within the European world. I speak about an Islam that constructed its intellectual, theological, existential perception, as well as its spiritual, dogmatic, and behavioral characteristics in the heart of the non-Muslim and non-Arab worlds. And let me here give you just one example of something happened in the Middle East that might uh, explain what I'm trying to talk about. There were European Muslims who since, who since 2014 traveled to my homeland, Syria, and participated in the wars there. Many European Muslims joined ISIS in Syria, not to fight the regime, but rather to fight other Syrian local Muslims and force them to either succumb to the version of Islam these European Muslims brought forth with them, or to be considered infidels and defected 
from true Islam and to face death. The difference between the European Islam of these European ISIS fighters and the Islam of the Syrian locals led to the mass murdering of thousands of Syrians just because these latter were not deemed true Muslims according to this model of European Islam. Now, what we have here in the European Islam model that I pointed to above is a particular Islam that is actually different from the Islam we know in its traditional Arabic or Muslim models. The European Muslim, the Syrian people experience in the phenomenon of ISIS invite us as scholars to seriously discern a new form of Islam born and developed inside the European context and one that is actually not friendly to the Arab Islam. What helps us to realize this is ceasing to approach the Islam that is imaged by European Muslims as another conventional collectivist religiosity phenomenon. We should cease looking at it in this way. In another essay I also published in the same journal in 2016, and it's titled The Changes of the Religious Imagination, I argued that the European and Western Islam manifests before us, before our eyes, the rising of a new Islam that is shaped after the postmodernist, individualist, subjectivist, and personalist trends of orientations toward the religious experience. We have a predomination of an individualistic, personalist, existential, experiential, and epistemological tendency over the tendencies that are traditionally and historically definitive of the Islam that the public in the Arab world, the cradle of Islam, are familiar with. It was the American philosopher William James in his The Varieties of Religious Experiences, who told us that the religious experience in the American European rationale is personalist and not institutional in nature. By personalist, James meant that the religious experience is an individual subjectivist orientation. The awareness and thought of the religious persons would be totally occupied with feelings, needs, struggles, interactions, and crises that are all privative in nature and not primarily or necessarily connected to or conditioned by the familial, institutional, communal, or societal religious dimensions, which these persons' parents and grandparents might be affiliated to. This means, William James adds, that in the Western and European imagination, the core of the religious orientation is the endeavor of the individual person to please and satisfy him or herself vis-a-vis -vis a privative connection with the divine holy other. And this is conducted after preconceptions, prejudices, and expectations that are only valuable and meaningful to that religious person alone. Such religiosity is often different, James concludes, from the religious rationale and discourses that are taught by the religious institution of that religious belief and not always rooted in this belief's theological message. In the light of William James's interpretation, one can postulate that the European Islams are models of Islamic affiliations that are shaped after individualized religiosity that aims at making the individual person capable of imposing his or her own religious awareness over against the collectivist and hegemonic religious experiences of the collectivist, institutionalized, and traditional non-European Islam. If one reads the characteristics of the Islam, the ISIS fighters from Europe manifested before the Arab Muslims in the Near East, or even around the world during the past years, one can realize traces and features of what William James describes as characteristic of the subjectivist individual-centered religiosity 
in the Western European context. One can encounter the very same individualist, private, personalist, and anti-institutional orientations in the European American Christianities as well, by the way, where postmodernist Christianity in the Western world is becoming much frankly anti-collectivist and far away from the conventional institutionalized and traditional Christianity of the past. And it is because of that we speak about the lone wolf's phenomena today in scholarship. I'm not going to elaborate further on this here. I did this sufficiently in my above mentioned two essays. I just wanted to say that in today's scholarship, a third hermeneutic approach to the subject of Europe and Islam must be developed to exceed the conventional ones of Europe and slash versus Islam on one side and Islam on, in Europe on the other side. This third approach is the one that pays attention to Islamic Europe or European Islam. Concluding remarks. Let me now bring this presentation into some conclusions, which I will state in six points. Excuse me. First point, it seems to me that whatever our approach to the relation between Europe and Islam was, whether it followed Europe and slash versus Islam or Islam in Europe or even European Islam model, the scholar must avoid anyhow any attempt at essentializing Islam. Islam must never be treated as one static self-contained self-sufficient, hermetically sealed, meta-historical entity. We must rather approach Islam as historical, contextual, pluralist, floxal, and pluriform phenomena. We must do this even if many Muslims, even if many Muslims insisted that Islam is otherwise. Second point. As in the case of Islam, we need to also avoid categorically essentializing Europe as well. We should avoid this essentialization of Europe, even if many Europeans imagine that one can truly speak about Europe as one monolithic, fixed, static, and absolute reality. Europe as one single entity might actually exist only in the Greek mythology of Europa and Cadmus and nowhere else. Third point, I do believe that the European Muslims and the Muslims in Europe alike must equally and seriously consider the possibility that the European stance on the presence of Islam in the continent might not always or necessarily manifest a stance of Islamophobia, but rather a more general and far deeper and complicated religiophobia situation, which all religious communities in the European context need to pay attention to. Point number four. European Islams are factual phenomena that are rooted anthropologically, sociologically, and contextually in the very same Greco-Latin tradition and modernist, postmodernist rationale of the European Christianities and Judaisms. They are not necessarily Islam's demonstrative of affinity to Arab, African, or Asian Islams from territorial and civilizational perspectives. Point number five. Some trends of European Islam can actually be dangerous and threatening in their radical non-collectivist version to the non-European Islams, not just to the world, but also to the non-European Islams. Whether this challenge and threat is a good or a bad thing, whether it is useful to help the conventional Arab, Asian, and African Islams to evolve, or rather it is a cause of their peril, these are all open questions 
and the answer for them are yet to be found out and discovered. And the road is, I think, still long ahead of us to find answers for them. Final point, point number six. The European countries might actually need to approach Islamic communities as indigenous local cases, indigenous local cases that manifest genuine data about the conditions and evolution process of the indigenous European contexts in their very own being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Awad. <clears throat> I invite everyone to uh, make questions by using the chat and I will pick the question from the chat and direct it to uh, Professor Wad. So uh, please, uh, please <laughs> use the, the chat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yes, let's see, we'll wait. Yes, it takes a little bit before the, you, they send something in the chat, so. but. Before uh, we have a first question in the chat, I would like to ask a question to you, Professor Abad. The first question would be, this is an interesting suggestion for how to understand the, the complexity within Islam itself. Uh, do you think that uh, the complexity is not understood fully enough in the Middle East? Now, you are addressing it in the sense, you know, we as Westerners, but would you say that the complexity is considered enough by the Christians, especially in the Middle East? Thank you for the question, uh, Professor. Uh, this is a very good question. Um, as you noticed, I focused on Islam and Europe because that's sort of the main framework of the uh, lecture. But I, to come back to the Middle East, I think um, we do lack a, a good perception of the complexity of the of Islam and the Islamic situation in the Middle East. I think we lack that perception uh, for many reasons. Um, and one can uh, discern these reasons um, in the Christian non-Muslim communities in the Middle East and in the Muslim ones uh, differently. Um, so um, among the Christians, since you asked about that, um, there are Christian intellectuals there and probably um, a low percentage of Christians in the Middle East who would uh, definitely perceive that complexity. And they will tell you, yes, we are aware of that fact that there are more than uh, one Islam. There are Islams out there and Muslim Islamic approach. But unfortunately, this percentage is low. The majority uh, are, if I allow myself to say, cocooned in uh, that image that there is one block static called Islam uh, over against uh, Christianity or over against everything non-Muslim. Uh, um, and they tend to um, speak about uh, Islam not as the Muslims, but more as you know, uh, one monolithic absolute entity. Uh, that manifests itself in the Muslims, rather than uh, it is uh, the reality is that we have Muslims manifesting themselves in that religious belief they hold. Now you ask what the, why the Christians in the Middle East, um, most of them cling to that? Uh, probably because it has to do, partially, it has to do with how Islam itself present itself before these Christians in the Middle East. There is a tendency, and that's, I'm saying this as an observer, I allow myself to say that there is a tendency in the uh, Arab Muslim world for, for also the majority of Muslims to speak about Islam as if it's one entity, as if it's one monolithic reality that is definite, defi uh, uh, defining, that defines every Islamic community and every Islamic variety. So in the non-Muslims, mind in the Middle East. Yes, there are differences between Shiite, Sunnite, let's say, between um, some Christians might know that there are differences between different Muslim schools of thought, 
But overall, the Muslims present themselves as one unified, uh, solidly static uh, entity before the non-Muslims uh, in the Arab world. And that fosters in the mind of the Christian that imagination that uh, after all, when we speak about uh, Muslims, we are talking about one phenomenon, one reality, namely one absolute Islam. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, the next question before we take the first one in the chat is, would be a follow-up. Would you say that it's cocoonization is the major difficulty for uh, developing democracy in the Middle East? Cocoonization is, I think, a challenge for developing democracy everywhere. Everywhere. Middle East included, indeed, but everywhere, because in my mind, tokenization is over is is opposite of plurality. Because when you tend to box the other in certain identity, you forget that otherness is constitutive of who we are, all of us. Otherness becomes an instrument to actually reduce the other into something static in order to capture, to control, in order to manipulate even if you can. And these are all actually against the uh, plurality as a value which uh, invites you to actually foster difference, encourage difference. Um, so definitely tokenization is against democracy, uh, not just in the Middle East, everywhere. And I think it's in a way, sometimes challenges democracy in the Western world, if I may allow my, here in the United States, we had ideal examples of that during the Donald Trump era. <laughs> uh, and that has nothing to do with Islam. This is just, you know, pure Western where um, certain mentality cocoon boxed, you know, uh, uh, certain segments of our communities within America, and then really uh, uh, stood against all any democratic value this country defines itself with. And I think one can find similar examples in Europe as well. Then we have a first question that is, do you think that the main problem in Europe is the Muslim Brotherhood who, who built many mosques promoting their views? Muslim Brotherhood are a challenge, are definitely a challenge in uh, as much as I know. I'm not expert in um, uh, radical Islam area of study. I study Islam, uh, but I'm not this expert enough to give digits or to give, you know, statistics or uh, down to earth examples. But I do know from what I read about uh, that and the Muslim Brotherhood impact on European uh, uh, world uh, by other scholars that there is definitely a challenge in Muslim Brotherhood because they try to what they call in their ideology to Islamize society from within. That Islamization is definitely one of the things that I probably alluded to when I spoke about that second stance in the second model of Islam in Europe which is Islamophobia. There's a fear that actually this Islamization is, is not just a, a, an expression of rejection of integration, but it's also uh, an attempt at really making Islam an alternative. Rather than making Islam part and parcel of the European uh, sphere of life, it is presenting Islam as an alternative of it. And that alternative mentality is definitely dangerous. And I do know that um, from my reading of Muslim Brotherhood and study of them, that in their ideology, in their um, worldview, that uh, making Islam as an alternative, the alternative, is uh, constitutive of how they think. The second question is, um, uh, I like your point about the fear of religion, not just Islam in Europe. However, would you say that this fear is somewhat more specific slash more intensive in the case of Islam since it is combined with other ethnic culture, etc., othernesses that go hand in hand with Islam and its perception in Europe? 
Um, good question. Very good question. Um, I think it is more conspicuous. Uh, th that, let's say, that fear from Islam is the, 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 that piece in the puzzle that is most seen, most, uh, 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 the, 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 the European studies are most aware of than other pieces of that picture. Simply, I think because of two, first because, because of the European media. European media tends to actually shed uh, over strong light on uh, these radical violent that are very few actually, uh, uh, statistically speaking, that are few examples. Radical violent cases of Muslims raising their voice in the public square and expressing their anger uh, in a violent manner. So the, the European media actually sheds strong light on these cases and label them and also box them and presents them as if they are definitive of Islam, that cocoonization policy again. So that's one factor. The other factor has to do with uh, the fact that um, Islam, there is an Islam, there is an Islam that uh, stripe of expressive of expression, wherein some uh, a minority of Muslims tend to express their disagreement, their rejection, their dissension in violent, in not, let me even put it this way, in a loud voice, in a very blunt, loud voice, direct manner uh, in the public square. And they use the public scene as a platform for making their voice heard as loudly as possible. That stripe also is easily seen because it happens in front of the public. And then the public think that the main problem lies in Islam and is related to Islam. But for example, media doesn't speak much analytically seriously about the uh, other segments of uh, societies or communities or individuals in European societies who perpetrate violent radical actions, not just against Muslims, but against any other different from them in the same way they do about uh, Islam. This is why we feel that it is not religiophobia, but it is Islamophobia. But I, I believe one has to be um, sort of, has a cool, uh, a, cool, a cool head in relation to that by looking at the broader framework and realize actually that um, um, there is a return to religiosity into the European scene because we, we, we passed from modernity to postmodernity. And um, um, there is fear among, I think, European, many Western uh, people that this return of religiosity to the public square might be an attempt at gaining prevalence and domination again. Um, and I think that's a psychological, as I described, that's a psychological fear. Uh, um, and Islam uh, just um, is the loudest, I mean, that these Muslims who, who trigger Islamophobia have just louder voice than others, that's all. The third question, maybe you have already answered in some parts, but I'll read the third question. How do you see the future of Islam in Europe in terms of secularization tendencies within Muslim communities? Do you think that Islam in Europe will become less religious in time or more intensely religious as a result of the othering process, processes in plural? Yeah, um, forgive me if I start my answer with saying this. Um, you know, scholars, academics are not prophets, so we don't, anticipate um, or oversee the future. We analyze and critically uh, uh, deconstruct things after they happen. So uh, I, don't, I cannot answer that question. I don't know what we, how, is, how things will happen. And second, in my paper, I try to invite us all to pay attention to the fact that there is no such thing like Islam. So we can't speak about where Islam is going. We have to speak about where Islam, in certain context, in certain historical situation, in certain location is going. 
So where is Islam, where the Muslims are going in Sweden is different from where the Muslims are going in France or in Germany or in Austria or in Holland. Why? Because the, the, the context is different. The, 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 the uh, cultural, social, political, anthropological processes of involvement in these contexts are very different. As I said, we should not essentialize Europe as well. So um, there is no such thing like where Islam is going. We have to study uh, locations one by one and go microcosmically and then see uh, how things are evolved within every context. Thank you, Professor, for the lectures. The fourth question. You said that in Europe, a new Islam is evolving that is even a threat to Muslims of the Middle East. Though reality shows that these are ideas uh, led by some groups of people from the Middle East or from the native lands of Islam, don't you think it is better to identify narratives which promote such ideas better than denying their existence? No, I'm not denying their existence. Of course they exist. And I, as I, I didn't make here a paper on ISIS as such. I didn't, uh, so I do understand uh, the concern of the inquirer that maybe I did not have enough time to unpack uh, a whole picture about ISIS per se and its ideologies and where are these uh, ideas, uh, they, uh, where do they derive these ideas about Islam from and all that. And we do know, of course, that they say the major uh, sort of intellectual uh, voice behind ISIS is a Bahraini young guy, Bahraini young scholar, Muslim scholar, who is following Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah, we can do that. But my question was different. My question was why would, and maybe I should have put that question clearly in the paper. My question was why would a Muslim, European Muslim, why would a European Muslim, a French Muslim, an English Muslim, a, a, a Dutch Muslim, a Swedish Muslim, a German Muslim, etc. Why would they decide uh, one of a sudden to go to Syria to fight for Islam? And why when they arrive there and they, they would join ISIS, and when they join ISIS, the ISIS fighters who came to Syria uh, um, were 25,000 in number. Almost 16 to 18,000 of them were European. Now, why would this European come, for example, to a city in Syria like Raqqa? And they will tell the people of the city, the inhabitants, who are 99% Muslim Sunnites. Why would they tell them, you either follow our Islam or you are not Muslim and you will be killed. And by the way, these fighters told the Christians in the city who are 1%, if you became Muslims, we will allow you to stay in the city and we will protect you. If you refuse to become Muslims, they did not tell them we will kill you. They told them we will kick you out of the city. We will exile you. I was told these stories by Raqqa people, by people from Raqqa, Syrians. But for the Muslims tonight, they told them, you either be, follow our Islam or you are, you are dead. Now, my question here is sociological more, not dogmatic, not doctrinal. My question is more sociological, anthropological. What kind of Islam these fighters from Europe have in their mind? And what kind of a rationale made them think that their Islam is right and that other Islam is wrong? So we don't have here really Islam against another religion. We have Islam, Islam. So that gives me as a scholar an indication that we're speaking here about two different Islams. Whether these Islams can be proven to be the same or not is another question. But in the mind of these Muslims, these are different Islams. And these Muslims, European, by the way, who came to, to uh, the Middle East, some of them learned Arabic in Syria. For them, they were born in Europe. 
They are European. They know their, their mental awareness is European, totally European. That's European Islam. That's not really Syrian Islam or Arab Islam for that matter. So that was my point. Uh, so I'm not at all denying um, uh, that yes, one can find roots and elements in ISIS doctrines that go back to uh, certain Islamic uh, intellectual tradition. I'm just studying uh, uh, um, that uh, phenomenon of European Islam as the scholars today study it, which is from not the dogmatic or theological perspective, but from sociological, as I said, and anthropological and contextual ones. The next question. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the interesting lecture. I am very happy to hear in the lecture the possibility to identify the Islamic ideology in Europe in various ways. I would be highly flexible to accept different ways for understanding Islamic ideology in European context. But what do you think is the Islamic ideology that lies in the midst of European Muslims? Can you please focus a light on this point? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I, I clearly understand the question. The core Islamic idea that lies in the European... Um, yeah. what, what would be the, 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 the core Islamic ideology in the midst of European Muslims? I honestly don't... don't, don't I'm, I'm personally, I doubt there is one core Islamic ideology. Yeah, that could be an answer. But That's enough. I think I think there are ideologies, in, if you want. If and then we have to agree there are ideologies. <laughs> they might be certain worldviews, certain imaginations, but I don't know how ideological. To what extent they are ideological? I, I don't know. Next question: Do you think that Western Islamophobia is a result of lack of integration on the Muslims in the Western world? Um, no, I think. Phobia, phobia is always two sides. Phobia is always two sides on, uh, on human level, of course. Phobia is always two sides because we're talking here about two human sides. We're talking about local European people living in certain place and then immigrants coming from outside. Both are human, both have psychology, both are afraid from each other. Don't think ever that the immigrants, Muslims, Christians, or any immigrants coming from all over the world to live in Europe are less afraid than the locals. Both communities are afraid, both individuals are afraid because fear is a human, natural human uh, uh, feeling, experience. It is our uh, human expression uh, of uh, um, lack of knowledge. We fear what we don't know. We fear what we are not sure about. Um, and to come to integration, uh, I allow myself to say, you know, and I'm someone who, has, who uh, uh, has been living on the two sides of the Atlantic for 21 years now. And I'm, I'm fully my, my identity is Middle Eastern, but, you're, but Western as well. And my identity is multifaceted, as any identity is, actually. Um, and I've, I kept observing and trying to perceive the idea of integration. Because when I came to the West as a Christian, I'm Christian, I'm not a Muslim, uh, I also was expected to integrate. Now, I did everything I can ever uh, to integrate, to become really part of that society. But to be honest with you, until this very day, if you ask me integration to what, I cannot answer that question. What is exactly the question really? When you say to others, others, Muslims or non-Muslims, integration to European way, what is that? Integration to what exactly? Language? But there are very radical people who speak the language fluently. Integration to what? Ways of living, habitos, social habitos. But social habitos are by nature multiform. 
they are not uniform. Otherwise, you will all dress the same, exactly the same colors, the same way. We will all act mechanically the same way. We will be like, uh, um, uh, um, you know, uh, machines. So integration to what exactly? I think that's a serious question which um, the European and uh, uh, um, platforms, our intellectual platform that call for it must think about must think seriously about integration to what exactly? Or abiding with the constitution and the law, many radicals abide with it, but they're still called not, not integrated. So we need first to specify integration to what before we ask for it. Do you think your study will be accepted among Christian thinkers who li still lives in, in the Middle East, or shall they <laughs> refuse it? I don't know. I have to read it for them and, and see the reaction. I, <laughs> I, honestly, I honestly don't know. I don't want to judge any one of them. But of course, by the nature of any idea, people, some people might agree, others might disagree. So. I'm not seeking uh, public uh, consent and satisfaction, to be honest. That's not what the academic or the scholar uh, do. We, we, we just study things and try to be as much objective, as much um, uh, reliable scientifically as we can in our analysis. Whether this would satisfy the people or not is not our job. I'm not a populist. I, that's, I'm against populism anyway. How do you see some movements which are intended, uh, how do you see the movements uh, which are intended to form the Islamic State? I think you, you answered that question partly before, right? Yeah, it's, it's a danger, exactly. It's a, it's, a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing indeed, but it's a, it's a dream in the mind of some, of some uh, s s segments of uh, Muslims establishing the Islamic State. But one has to keep in mind that within the circle of the Islamic trends that call for establishing Islamic State, there are so many interpretations of what Islamic State stands for. So many interpretations, and some of them clash with each other bitterly. So one has to always ask what kind of Islamic State this voice is calling for. And then we study that and we counterpart it accordingly. So thank you very much for your presentation. Is the next question. How important is it, according to you, to incorporate more teachings about otherness in Eastern Christian among for Eastern Christian priest education as a way to improve relations between Christian and Muslims and others? <laughs> That's a very good question. Very, very perceptive question. And thank you for it. Um, I, I come from the Protestant churchly speaking, Ecclesia from the Protestant community of Syria. So in the Middle East, if I would say what I would say now, the Orthodox would say that's a Protestant speaking against us. Um, but I agree fully. We need to teach about otherness and the idea of otherness, not just to Eastern uh, Orthodox Christianity, but to Christianity all over. Yes, in the West, uh, it was, uh, the Christian centers of education, of intellectual scholarly work that really develop theories, profound theories about othering and otherness, uh, which we all learn from. Um, and definitely in the Middle East, we have yet still a lot to learn about that. The idea of otherness is in the Middle East uh, not fully attended to. There are beautiful, great uh, voices of Eastern theologians who talked about that throughout the history of Eastern Christianity, by the way. The patristic tradition has beautiful examples of that. Um, but today, um, Eastern Christianity finds itself uh, very much under the challenge of survival. And that challenge of survival makes the Eastern Christians occupied um, existentially by themselves more than by, uh, more than asking a question about the other. 
when you tend to, to, to just struggle to survive, all, all what you think about is yourself. And of course, those who are close to you, the closest to you. Therefore, the idea of the other becomes inevitably or inescapably for that matter, um, intellectual luxury. Um, this is why Eastern Christianity is very much occupied with itself. Um, but I think I'm one of those Eastern Christians who invite all the Christian communities in the Middle East to realize that actually survival lies in relating to the other. Without relating to the other, without opening up toward feeling that you and the other, the non-Christian other or uh, any other, you and that other live in the same situation. The other is also seeking survival as much as you are. Unless we realize that, we might not actually find a way to survive. Survival does not, in the Middle East, does not lie, as my opinion at least, in self-enclosure. Does not lie in self-protectionism. It lies rather in openness, in traveling toward the other, in telling the other, and realizing yourself at least, realizing that um, we are not just responsible of solutions, we are also part of the problem. Unless we do that, I think there is no survival to Eastern Christianity in the Middle East. Without the others, there is no survival. But we need Christian, Eastern Christian voices to tell the Middle East Christians about that. As a follow-up of this question, we have an additional question now. Uh, if you take the Christian communities in the diaspora and we compare them with their native church communities, we can notice a difference where the uh, when the local community in their homeless uh, are not afraid from developing things, uh, the diaspora seems to, to, to hold on to older thoughts than in the mm -hmm. homelands. Do you think yes. that can lead to a Christianity versus Christianity, so to say? I think I the idea is between the native homelands and the development in the diaspora. Yeah, interesting question. Very, very interesting question. And definitely needs further study from me. Um, but uh, what I can initially say about that is, yes, there is that phenomenon. And I noticed it as well by visiting uh, different um, churches, Christian churches established by immigrants from the Middle East in Europe or in the United States. Um, I think initially it has to do also with some uh, concern about identity. Um, there is, it seems to me, a, a, a zeal about uh, creating unique, different identity which will enable the community of that church in the expatriate land to say, we are different church. We don't belong to any other church in this land simply because we are different, because we have something different. In that sense, what we have here is an identity formation dynamic that lies in differentiation, not in distinction, I'm careful here in using my word. Not, it doesn't lie in distinction, but it lies in differentiation in terms of alterity and contrariety. Now, conservatism is alterity and contrariety. Okay, ecumenism, ecumenism is differentiation and distinction. I hope I make sense in what I'm saying. But these are in very important different states of relatedness and self-perception. To perceive myself as different from the other because I have, I'm unique, I have individuation is one thing. And to consider myself 
other than anyone else because what I have, no one else has. It's totally another thing. So I think there are communities of Christians, immigrant Christians in the Western world who are creating identities, their own identity by following an identity formation strategy that lies in difference, alterity and contrariety rather than lies in uh, differentiation and distinction. In other words, they are not uh, uh, non-ecumenical, but more conservative, not theologically, but sociologically, um, more anthropologically. I, I hope I give an answer, but I, I need myself to study that further. So uh, that's, then we come to the end of all questions. And um, I think I speak for everyone here who has been listening to this vivid lecture and uh, your extremely vivid uh, answers. And you have opened up a new path of investigations for us here. And we're so happy that you could join us in this series. This is next to the last lecture in this series during the spring. And um, uh, we got hold of you late, uh, as you know, but I'm so happy that you could with such a short notice come up with this interesting theme. I think we have learned a lot about the plurality, not just about Islam, but the plurality also of Christianity uh, when it comes to Eastern uh, Christian studies. But we are thinking about various Christianities also, both in comparison with the diaspora and in comparison with the Middle East. Uh, so on behalf of every one of us, uh, thank you so much, Professor Awad. And I don't think this is the last time we'll hear or see you and hopefully see you in three dimension also. So you can see actually how Sweden is and you will experience what uh, Swedish Christian, Muslim, uh, Protestant, Orthodox Catholic relations look like in this country. So thank you so much. And I ask Boyana to give us the further information. Uh, before Boyana gives that, I would like to thank you, Professor Elm, for reaching out and for inviting me to give this lecture. It's been a great honor to me to, uh, to do that. And I thank all the inquirers for their um, very rich, very profound uh, questions that definitely invite me to, uh, to uh, do further studies and to improve myself as well. And it would be my honor and my pleasure indeed to one day be able to visit your great country and to uh, learn from it and about it uh, at face, uh, uh, at first hand experience. Uh, and I'll be very glad indeed to be part of any activity you do in the future. Thank you very much indeed to you and to everyone attended this uh, session today. Boyana. Thank you so much, Professor Najib, uh, from my side as well. Uh, and uh, as Michael said, we are slowly approaching to the end of our uh, this terms uh, lecture series. So we have our last lecture series uh, lecture next Thursday. So June, June the third, it is Dr. Sofia Camerin who will give a lecture on ecumenical global diplomacy. So you're more than welcome to join us for our last faculty lecture this. Uh, this spring. Uh, thank you so much once again and hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Boyana. Bye-bye, everybody.